morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word about the celebration of grace. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Do me a favor, send a link to this, me- you know, of, of this message to as many friends as you have. Let's get as many people as possible watching our online services. All right, I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. Well, I don't know if if many of you are Shakespeare fans, but if you are a Shakespeare fan or if you know a little bit about some of the plays and some of the characters in the plays, there's a particular character that is really interesting, and that is the character Lady Macbeth. And if you know her character, she ends up murdering somebody. And when she does so, obviously she tries to come clean because she's guilty. She's filled with shame. She's filled with regret. And so she starts washing her hands. And of course, she watches, washes the stains out of her hands. But her conscience is dogging her. Her conscience will not stop, you know, uh, convicting her, if you will. And so she keeps washing her hands and washing her hands, even though the stains, the blood stains, are off of her hands. And psychologists have studied this this tendency, and they call it the Lady Macbeth effect. And what they have found is individuals that have done something that they regret, uh, they've done something incredibly shameful, something that they are entirely ashamed of, there's a tendency within uh, individuals to try to keep washing or to do something to cleanse themselves from something they regret. And researchers have borne this out in studies. There was a study that I just read this past week by psychologists. They, they, they did an experiment and they, they asked different subject matters in this experiment to recall a good or a past deed. And those that recalled a, a past deed that they regretted, they were ashamed of, um, they presented them with a series of words, not unlike what you would see in um, Wheel of Fortune, where you'd see a word, but then several words, letters are missing, and you've got to pick out different ones. So they, they put up a word, W, space, space, H, and individuals that were dealing with a regret would fill in the words A-S. In other words, they'd spell the word wash. And another word was given to them, S-H, blank, blank, E-R. And those dealing with shame would put in O-W, so it would spell shower. And then another one, S space space P, (laughs) they spelled the word soap. And uh, so so in other words, what what they found out is individuals that are dealing with an unclean conscience, um, um, uh, consciously or even sometimes unconsciously, reveal that they are seeking atonement. They are seeking a cleansing. They are seeking to be set free from that which is dogging them. And so as we come across the section of scripture in Mark's gospel, chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, we come across a scene where the religious leaders of the day are challenging Jesus and his disciples because they don't fast. They don't do something in the law. They don't do some work in the law to supposedly virtue signal, as we would say today, or openly reveal to other people, hey, I'm clean, I'm right with God, I'm doing all these outward things. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about grace today, in particular, the celebration of grace that Jesus brings. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, the second chapter, verses 18. We're going to read 18 through 22. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? And Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast when he is with them? They cannot as long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on old garment. 
If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst and the skins, both the wine, I'm sorry, but the wine will burst the skins and both the old wine and the new wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Can we pray? Father God, I thank you for this time together under the ministry of your word. And as we contemplate the grace that Jesus came to bring as he brought forth his kingdom, and the celebration of grace that he wants us as his followers to enjoy. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit desires to reveal to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come across the scene where Jesus doesn't fast. Jesus doesn't play the game, so to speak, the religious game that's being played by the religious leaders of the day. And of course, um, in some respects, they were trying to obey the Old Testament law. Um, but in other respects, they were adding all kinds of man-made rules and regulations as to how they should please God. And Jesus punctured all of that in this account. So a couple of points I want us to understand. The first is simply this, is that God's kingdom disrupts the world's merit system with a feast. In other words, the world has all kinds of ways to measure up or try to prove that you are better than other people. And of course, in, in Jesus' day, the religious leaders were very fond of doing outward acts of religiosity to prove to everyone else that, hey, I am holier than thou, I am more righteous than thou, or I'm more spiritual than you are. And we see this today. We see virtue signaling. Uh, it's not unusual if you go to a, a college or a major university and look at a professor's door, you'll most likely see a rainbow flag there, or you'll maybe see a coexist uh, sticker there. You might even say, hey, we're with Ukraine, or we're with this disadvantaged group. In other words, they're virtue signaling. They're trying to outwardly reveal, hey, I'm with this particular group, or I'm perhaps with the cool kids club because of my support for this. What is that? That's nothing more than a religious impulse. It's nothing different than Adam and Eve feeling naked and ashamed before God when they sinned, trying to take something to cover their shame and their nakedness. What are you saying, Pastor E? Are you saying that virtue signaling, are you saying a rainbow flag or a coexist sticker, or, hey, support your latest disadvantaged group is nothing more than a religious impulse, a, a, an indication that people are trying to deal with something perhaps underlying, uh, you know, sin or stain or shame or guilt or something in their lives? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because God made us to worship him. And if we don't worship him, we'll keep worshiping. God made us to be a loving creature. We will love God supremely, or we will love something else or someone else supremely. And, and so, so if we don't love God supremely, we'll keep loving, we'll keep worshiping. If we can't get our sin atoned for because of the cross of Jesus and receive what Jesus has done for us, the stain remains, the guilt remains, the shame remains. And so instead of running to Jesus and having our sins completely forgiven, we will go to some form of virtue signaling. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. Again, what we're seeing today is, is, is again, it's human nature. Okay, it's repeated year after year after generation after generation after century after century after millennia after millennia. Okay, it's human nature. I've got to get righteous. I've got to be right before someone or something. If I'm not going to be right before God, the living God, and come to the cross, I want to be right horizontally with all the rest of the people on the earth. Hence, the incredible surge of social justice and virtual signaling and cancel culture and identity politics. All these are our religious impulse. They are secular religious impulses because a society has turned their backs on God, but the concept of sin and guilt and shame and the need for atonement remains. And so Jesus is addressing this. Now, when we take the, 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 the religious leaders of the day, if you look at your Old Testament, there's really only one commanded fast. God commanded a fast on the Day of Atonement. Other than that, we don't see any other God-ordained, God-commanded fast. Now, we see human-initiated fasts 
If you look at Zechariah chapter 8, it mentions four fasts during the post-exilic period in the 4th, 5th, 7th, and 10th month of the Jewish year, where they were supposed to be, they were mournful, but they're supposed to be joyful. But again, God didn't call them, the people did. And then you see a fifth fast during the Feast of Purim. Again, this is the Esther fast for God delivering them from Mordecai and, and the assassination attempt. Well, uh, uh, the genocide, if you will, of the entire Jewish people when they were in the Persian kingdom. Um, but again, that was humanly imposed, self-imposed. And then you've got the, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, that would add to all that, hey, we're going to fast twice a week. Okay, But again, they're trying to be made right by God by self-imposed fasts. Okay? And so the issue before Jesus here is, and the, the issue that the religious leaders were trying to, to, to put before Jesus is, pious people fast. <laughs> pious people virtue signal. You and your disciples don't fast what gives. And so we see Jesus disrupting the world's merit system. In other words, he's trying to say, listen, the, all of these, all of these outward acts that you're trying to horizontally reveal that you're righteous to all these other people, okay? <laughs> My, the kingdom that Jesus is really bringing is fundamentally incompatible with all of that. All of these are incompatible with the kingdom of God, which, if received, changes you from the inside. There's nothing you have to do <laughs> to be made right with Jesus. You have to receive what he's done for you, and in the inside, you're cleansed and made right. That's the most fundamental cleansing, healing, wholeness that every man, woman, and child need. And we see this hinted at in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, where Jeremiah says, this is the covenant, again, God is, is revealing this, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put their laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And so because of that eternal change, it totally blows to smithereens all virtue signaling. It's like, hey, <laughs> thanks for your efforts, but that's not going to be made, that's not going to make you right before God. And see, what Jesus came to bring really is a shortcut between humanity and God, because in our efforts, we can't get there. If you know anything about in the, the, the Old Testament account in the book of Genesis where Jacob had a vision of a ladder, a stairway, if you will, going to heaven, right? And angels ascending and descending on that, revealing the incredible gap between man and God. And of course, that reveals, hey, there's nobody that can get there. But Jesus gives us a shortcut because of his death on the cross, that if we receive him as our Lord and Savior, there's a shortcut to God. Well, guess what? The identity politics in 2023 America and the 2023 uh, Western world rejects that shortcut. Why? Because it's too demanding on each individual. Because you got to raise your hand and say, I'm owning my sin. I can't blame my sin on a heterosexual white male. I can't blame my sin on another advantaged, you know, uh, group in society that's supposedly oppressing another group. I've got to look within and say, listen, I'm crying uncle. I'm saying I'm a sinner. I'm the one that's the problem. I'm a re rebel against God, okay? People that embrace wokeism, cultural Marxism, identity politics, they reject that shortcut and they say, you know what? We're going to reject that because we find a different shortcut. We're going to scapegoat a particular group. Again, public enemy number one within wokeism, identity politics, is white heterosexual males. They're the bad guy. They're the oppressor. You've got to stoop down. You've got to be canceled. You've got to be humiliated. And so the thinking in identity politics is if I can humiliate a, a, an advantage group, like a white heterosexual male, I can feel better about myself at night because they become the scapegoat. They supposedly, through canceling them, they've atoned for my sin. But guess what? When proponents of wokeism go to sleep at night, guess what? Their conscience is still dogging them. They're still guilty. They still feel guilty. They still feel the shame. And so what they do is, hey, I've eliminated one group. Let's find the next group that we can start canceling. We can start virtue signaling. We're with this oppressed group. And now we can cancel another supposedly evil group. But the problem is that creates a horizontal salvation. 
and it doesn't solve the fundamental vertical problem with every person. You are a rebel, rebel toward the living God. And you, the only way you can be made right before him is to receive what Jesus has done for you. Okay, So that's the first point. Jesus obliterates the world's merit systems. The second is he reveals, listen, it's impossible to fast or virtue signal at a wedding party. In other words, if you truly embrace the kingdom of God, if you truly receive Christ as your savior, you don't need to fast anymore. You need to feast. And what's interesting about that, because Jesus says this in Mark 2, 19, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? And so he's revealing to the religious leaders, hey, the bridegroom is here. It's me. And because I'm here, no fasting allowed, no virtue system, no virtue signaling allowed. The world's merit system is gone because in the Jewish thinking of that day, it was illegal to fast during a wedding party. You couldn't fast, you couldn't mourn, you couldn't work because it was a celebration. Man, put your celebration shoes on, put your dancing shoes on, let's get dancing, let's get celebrating because he's revealing the kingdom of God that causes all of the world's, you know, uh, additions, subtractions, uh, and, 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 and merit systems, all of those are obsolete now. And, and so God says, listen, it's time to throw a party. Now, he does say, listen, when the bridegroom is taken away from, him, from them, they will fast. So Jesus is hinting at his death on the cross. And during that time, his disciples did fast. Who feels like eating when the Savior of the world is, is humiliating, humiliated and dying on a, on, a, on a Roman cross? However, the resurrection took place. And it revealed that, listen, this, this fasting was just for a temporary time, but you're feasting now. You're a part of this wedding feast. The bridegroom is here with you. And theologians will tell us that, that after Jesus died and ascended to the Father, the early church lived as if Jesus was there with them. Of course, he said, listen, it's better for me to go away. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come and live within you. But, but, but even as the Holy Spirit lived within the early church, they had an awareness at all times. The bridegroom is with us. His presence is with us. We are not going to mourn. We're going to celebrate. We're going to be a joyful people. And, and, the, and the early church separated themselves with the Greco-Roman world that despite all the persecutions and all the ostracism, the social ostracism that took place, you know, that basically tried to marginalize Christians and Christianity, they were filled with joy. And it reminds me of one of my favorite Proverbs that says this. It says in Proverbs chapter, let me see if I can find it here. There it is, Proverbs 15, 15. The days of the oppressed are wretched. Think about that. If you're oppressed all the time or you think you're oppressed all the time or you take on the, the, the nature of, hey, I'm an oppressed group, <laughs> tell you what, that's a wretched way to live. But the cheerful heart has a continual feast, right? In other words, if you understand the resurrection of Jesus, there is no, no one is terminal because Jesus lives today. No struggle, no fear, no pain, no shame, no sickness, no heartache is greater than the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus relativizes all of that pain and it tells us, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, as 1 Corinthians 15 says. So because of that, guess what? You don't have to live on crumbs. You don't have to live on a starvation diet. You don't have to be beholden to, to every single aggrieved group in America that's saying, I'm oppressed and woe is me and I'm going to virtue signal and you better take up my case or you're going to be canceled. You don't have to play that game. You don't have to live on scraps. You can, be a, you can feast. In other words, you can have a cheerful and joyful heart because you know that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. You're filled with resurrection power so you can have a continual feast. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to live in that? That's what we're called to. That's the kingdom that we've been given. And finally, we see here in this section of scripture that the, there's an entirely new situation that's brought about by the kingdom of God. Because Jesus said, listen, 
if, if, you're take, if you've got new wine, and of course new wine is fermented, it's continually expanding, you don't put it in old wineskins. Old wineskins, they literally had animal skins that got old and dry and brittle. And so if you poured new wine in it as that wine is fermenting and is expanding, it basically obliterates <laughs> those wineskins. He's trying to say, listen, I'm not trying to put a patch on the Old Testament system. I'm not put, trying to put a patch on virtue signaling. I'm not just trying to kind of prop it back up again. I'm obliterating all of that. In other words, the new wine, the new life, the kingdom life, the resurrection power I'm coming to bring, it obliterates the world's merit system. It can't even contain it at all. You've got to have a paradigm shift. You've got to have pliable hearts that are open to the celebration that is the kingdom of God, the victory that is the kingdom of God. That's, what, that's how you receive this kingdom. You cannot do it the old way that you used to do. You, in other words, you, you can't be right with God through works righteousness. There's nothing you can do that'll make you right with God. And even if you could, how do you know how many works it takes to be right before God? And how do you know how long you have to do it? And what if you died early? What, what, right, what a miserable state of affairs. And Jesus is saying, listen, it's all grace. It's my grace. The resurrection is grace. In other words, Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection glory and body that we're all going to have. And it's all promised to us. And you can't get it by human works. You can't get it by virtue signaling. It's all grace. And he's talking about this incredible celebration of knowing him and serving him and receiving the kingdom. And why is that significant? Because again, we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he gives us the victory through Jesus. So because of that, he can say in verse 58, my brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. In other words, th there are struggles we face, there are sicknesses we face, there's difficulties we face, there are disappointments, but if you truly understand the grace of God that's on your life, as someone who follows Jesus. If you truly understand that, man, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of me, guess what? There's always victory. There's always a cheerful feast. And so you don't have to be moved by your circumstances. You can be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Right, You can be someone that sets the pace, sets the temperature of the room, sets the temperature, the attitude in your home because of Jesus dwelling inside of you instead of being a proverbial thermometer and you're always responding to every single circumstance that sets you back. Amen? And so I want to leave you with that today. Are you, are you fasting or are you feasting today? In other words, are you trying to do things to please God? Or, God forbid, you're following the latest trend in virtue singling in all of this wokeism in our culture, and you're trying to virtue signal, say, I'm with this group or I'm with that group. Guess what? That's a fig leaf. It's going to blow off. Guess what? That's works righteousness. Guess what? That doesn't heal the fundamental problem in your soul and that, that you are a rebel against God. You are rebelling against him and the way to be made right with the God of the universe, of whom I and you will answer to. To whom we will answer. We will answer to him, right? The only way to be made right with him is to come to the cross and say, Jesus, I receive what you've done for me. And I receive you into my heart. And I receive your kingdom. I want to enter your kingdom. Please forgive me of my sins. And Lord God, help me to follow you. If you do that, guess what? Feasting is coming your way. Joy is coming your way. The scripture says, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Again, it's a celebration of grace that we have as Christians. There's nothing we can do to please God. He's already done it for us. What we need to do is receive it. What we need to do is walk in it and live and move and have our being in it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word this morning, God. And I pray for every person that listens to this message, God, that they would enjoy the continual feast that is the grace of God, that is the kingdom of God. There's nothing we have to do. Jesus has already done it for us. God, let us rest 
and that grace. God, let us turn our backs on works righteousness. Let us turn our backs and repent of virtue signaling. And God, let us recognize that what you've done for us is enough. And we don't have to please man anymore. We just need to please you. And one of the great ways that we please you is we receive what, you are, what you've done for us. And Lord, we thank you for this time together. And God, I pray a blessing on all your people that are hearing this message and seeing this message. I pray this in Jesus' name. Church, it was great to be with you. And until next week, I call you blessed. Take care.